Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn DeWire and this is the Norman Invasion Part 19, Living and Dying by the Sword. This show is very important in terms of the series on the Norman Conquest and one not to be missed as we move forward. It covers crucial but violent events where a lot of our key characters struggle to survive. At the end of the last show, Prince John, son of King Henry II, had come to Ireland hoping to establish himself as overlord. The Norman lords, led by Hugh de Lacey, the Lord of Meath, had completely outfoxed him and by December 1185, John's plan had unravelled and he left Ireland. We pick up the story at Christmas 1185 where no one was certain what would happen next, given John's plans were in tatters. No one could have foreseen how things played out. It's one of those times where history heads off in its own direction, with little rhyme or reason to it. Before we get into the show, I want to give you a final reminder about this Saturday, June 6th, tour through medieval Ireland. I am really excited by what is a limited and unique tour to some of Ireland's most historic locations, on the trip, you will visit the early monastic site of Glendalough and its stunning surrounds, Kilkenny Castle, the medieval town of Kilkenny, a trip inside St. Canice's Cathedral in the city, as well as one of the only round towers in Ireland that you can climb. Your day will finish in a somewhat forgotten but spectacular spot, Kilcoody Abbey. If you want to join me on this trip, this is your last opportunity. You can book your place now on the coach by contacting me at booking at irishhistorytours.ie That's booking at irishhistorytours.ie Don't forget, this is your last chance as the tour is happening this Saturday. The medieval festival of Christmas was nothing like it is today. It was just one of several important Christian festivals that took place throughout the year. In the late medieval period, it was marked by a 12-day celebration beginning on Christmas Eve and continuing through to the New Year. In 1185, Christmas celebrations varied throughout the Norman world. In Ireland, they arrived just as the Norman lords were in a jubilant mood. The previous April, Henry II had sent his young son John to Ireland with the intention of making him overlord. This would have seriously curtailed the power of the Norman lords. However, led by the Lord of Meath, Hugh de Lacey, they had plotted and schemed and successfully undermined the young prince. On December the 16th, he had finally boarded ship and headed back to England. Across the water in England, Christmas for the young Prince John was very different. His was flavoured by bitterness, anger and fear. He was no doubt angry that his would-be subjects, the Norman lords in Ireland, had rejected him. However, also fearful about what would happen when his father, King Henry II, known for his temperament, heard of his failure to stamp his authority in Ireland. Henry spent that Christmas of 1185 in the massive hulk of a castle at Domfranc in Normandy and would not have heard of John's failure in Ireland until the new year of 1186. Once he returned to England to hear his favourite son had been humiliated, he wouldn't have been pleased. However, this was only part of the problem he faced in Ireland. Restraining the power of the Norman lords on the island would be more difficult than ever now. Indeed, John's departure left the island in the hands of a man who had little interest in expanding royal power. Before he departed, the prince had made John de Courcy the king's representative. However, if there was ever a freebooter and a lawless lord, it was de Courcy. He had no more interest in expanding John or Henry II's power in Ireland than the other lords had. He was the very essence of a Norman mercenary, having invaded eastern Ulster off his own bat in 1177 without any permission. To make matters worse, the one Gaelic king in Ireland Henry had had some long-term relationship with, Roy O'Connor, was now a fading star as the most lethal of civil wars seemed set to erupt in Connacht. There, almost a quarter of the land mass of Ireland was about to explode into violence between Rory, his brother Cahill of the Red Hand, and his son Connor. Henry, a man who had inherited the Kingdom of England when it was in a state of collapse after decades of civil war, was obsessed with law and order, and Ireland now seemed the antithesis of this, an increasingly lawless mess from his point of view. Meanwhile, Henry's most troublesome vassal, Hugh de Lacey had no such worries. 
Indeed, his future seemed bright. He was happy with the lack of overall structure in Ireland. Having seen off John, he was in many ways a king in all but name, as one Irish annal called him. His one major concern were those events in Connacht, where a civil war loomed between factions of the O'Connor family. Now, Hugh de Lacey had more than a passing interest in this coming war. Not only did he share a long border with Connacht along the Shannon River, but since 1181, when he had married Rose O'Connor, he was related to the family. De Lacey, like most Normans in Ireland, wanted his father-in-law, Rory O'Connor, to emerge victorious over his son, Connor O'Connor. Rory was pliable and generally sought peaceful relations with the Normans. Connor, however, was different, already having shown himself utterly hostile to the Normans. If he won, it would mean war. However, it was another, much more obscure conflict from deep in the past that had the biggest impact in Ireland in that summer of 1186. In July, Hugh de Lacey left his Lordship of Mead and moved south into Leinster to inspect the works at the construction of a castle near Durrow in modern County Kilkenny. There he was approached by a young man, Gilla Inahar Umwe. The two men probably had not met each other, but de Lacey was unforgettable. One side of his face was covered in scars. Seeing de Lacey, the young man immediately drew a concealed axe and made for the Norman lord. According to contemporary sources, with one blow he decapitated de Lacey, the body and head falling from the walls into the newly constructed moat below. The Norman Lord of Mead, the most powerful man in Ireland, was dead. This was not a carefully planned assassination by a political rival, but instead an act of vengeance over a Gaelic Irishman who had died at the hands of the Normans eight years earlier. However, history often turns on such incidental events as much as it does on carefully planned actions, and the death of Hugh de Lacey transformed the situation in Ireland. In the moat at the newly constructed castle at Durrow, lay the remains of a man who was the glue of the Norman project in Ireland. Feared and respected by Normans and Gaelic Irish alike, he had provided leadership to the Normans when they had most needed it. In 1176, Strongbow had died without an adult heir and de Lacey had proven himself more than able to fill his boots. But now his death in 1186 could not have come at a worse time. Strongbow's lands in Leinster remained without a resident lord his daughter Isabel was still a child while his son Gilbert had already died. However, now de Lacey's lordship of Mead had no adult heirs either, given his sons Walter and Hugh were both children. In accordance with the law, the lands now passed into royal hands and in this case into the hands of the Lord of Ireland, the young Prince John. He now controlled both the lordship of Leinster and the lordship of Mead until the respective heirs became adults. It was obvious that this moment of Hugh de Lacey's death offered the royal authorities in England a massive opportunity. The key figure who had resisted Prince John was dead. King Henry II supposedly even celebrated the news that this man, who was a major obstacle in Ireland, was dead and immediately made plans for Prince John to return. With de Lacey out of the picture, John could surely make another, more successful play for power in Ireland. However, just as the young prince was about to board ship, the news of another death, which had profound implications for Ireland, arrived in England. On August 19th, not long after Hugh de Lacey was murdered, Geoffrey, Duke of Brittany, the second eldest son of Henry II, was killed fighting in a tournament in Paris. The deceased Geoffrey had been a key pawn in Henry II's conflict against his eldest son, Richard the Lionheart. King Henry profoundly disliked and distrusted his son Richard, and refused to name him as heir, instead keeping him in line by dangling the threat of making some of his other sons, Geoffrey the Duke of Brittany, or even the young John, as heir. With Geoffrey dead, Prince John's status was now massively elevated. As second in line to the throne after Richard the Lionheart, Henry could not let him head off to Ireland. Instead, the ageing king needed him close, as John now became his last bargaining chip against his son, Richard the Lionheart. In Ireland, while Geoffrey's death saved the island from another visit from John, it was the death of Hugh de Lacey that had the most immediate impact. Indeed, it came at a seminal moment, as he was among the last of the early conquerors to die. 
As Hugh de Lacey tumbled from that castle wall at Durrow, his death symbolised the end of an era in Ireland. While he did not come to the island until 1171, he was still very much of that early generation that had been led by Strongbow and Maurice Fitzgerald. That generation now were nearly all dead by 1186. Raymond Le Gros, Strongbow's son-in-law and the best Norman military commander in Ireland had died sometime in the early 1180s, presumably of natural causes as his exact date of death was never recorded. Extraordinarily, the only one of these leaders to outlive de Lacey was the oldest of them all, Robert Fitzstephen. He had been among the first wave of Normans to land in Ireland in 1169. When he received word of de Lacey's death, he was 71 and nearing his own end. Indeed, Robert Fitzstephen was dead within a few years. These men, that first generation of conquerors, had witnessed phenomenal change in Ireland and indeed had inflicted phenomenal change on the island. As they departed the stage of history, the future in Ireland was far from certain. Remarkably, we have a record of the hopes of the Normans for Ireland at that seminal moment as the older generation died off. They were recorded by the chronicler Gerald of Wales, who has been a companion of ours through this series and someone I have quoted many times. In the late 1180s, Gerald concluded his great work on the evasion, the Expugnatio Hibernica, and he now bows out of our story as well. However, before he goes, it's worth recalling the final pages of his book, which offers us a unique insight into how the Normans saw their future in the mid-1180s. Gerald very much saw Ireland as an incomplete mission, and he makes it clear the Norman intention was to complete a total conquest. In 1186, Connacht was untouched, as was Western Ulster, and for any observer, this was somewhat worrying. The Normans had taken what could be called the soft underbelly of Gaelic Ireland, leaving the two most serious forces intact, the O'Connors in Connacht and the O'Neills in Ulster. Gerald felt that the Normans had missed an opportunity. It seemed to him that had they adopted a more aggressive attitude in the 1170s that they could have conquered the entire Ireland. Before concluding his work, Gerald proffered his thoughts on what might make the difference in the coming years and it did not bode well for the Gaelic Irish. He advocated total war against the Gaelic Irish, and said they should be disabled or completely destroyed. However, this proved somewhat detached from the reality of events, given what followed in the late 1180s in Ireland. Indeed, as Gerald collected his thoughts on Ireland, a crucial conflict was breaking out in Connacht between Rory O'Connor and his son, Connor. If Connor won, the Normans would soon find themselves at war with one of the most powerful forces in Gaelic Ireland. In the last episode, we saw how in the summer of 1185, a three-sided civil war had broken out in Connacht. The issue at the heart of this war had been the policy of the O'Connor family toward the Normans. Rory O'Connor had abdicated in favour of his confusingly named son, Connor O'Connor, in 1183. However, Connor had rejected his father Rory's policy of appeasement and attacked the Normans. In 1185, Rory, worried about what this policy would do, had attempted to take back his kingship, but Connor had resisted. Warfare had broken out between the father and son, and the following conflict had drawn in other contenders, most notably Rory's brother, Cahill of the Red Hand. While a peace of sorts had been established in later 1185, it was clear that no kingdom could have three claimants to the one throne. Connacht was a tinderbox. The inevitable war broke out in 1186 and it began when Connor attacked his father Rory. Through the following summer, Connacht was destroyed as the two most powerful men and their supporters went to war. There was no doubt though the son had a distinct advantage over his father. Rory was approaching 70 while Connor was probably still in his 30s. Even for those fighting in his army, the ageing Rory can hardly have been an inspirational leader at this point. By the end of the year, and after much blood was spilt, Connor emerged victorious. Initially, he exiled his father, but having secured his own position, he allowed Rory to return towards the end of the year of 1186 and granted him a small tract of land. For the Normans, the emergence of Connor meant war. Indeed, Connor as the new King of Connacht did not wait long. By the summer of 1187 he was attacking across the Shannon, striking at the castle of Kildare in Westmead. 
those inside the castle were trapped when it was set alight. While Connor plundered and took away what he could carry, hundreds were suffocated as the castle burned. Reports of the numbers of victims varied from over a hundred to seven hundred. Such an event could not go unpunished, and later in 1187 the Normans from Mead set out on a punitive raid into North Connacht. The key fortress, situated on an island in Loch Key on the Shannon River, was attacked and burned, and the fatalities here reached into the hundreds as well. The real conflict, however, only came the following summer, when the people of Connacht felt the full brunt of the Norman colonial leaders. In 1188, the entire north and west of Ireland was attacked by two large Norman armies. John de Courcy, the man who had conquered Ulster in 1177, was the king's representative in Ireland at this stage and it fell to him to respond to the O'Connor raid on Kildare Castle and he adopted a two-pronged strategy. He was personally going to lead an invasion north through Connacht that would drive up through the kingdom like a knife towards the borders of Ulster. Meanwhile, from de Courcy's own land in eastern Ulster, another Norman army would drive west into the O'Neill heartland of western Ulster. Whether the two armies planned to meet on the borders of Connacht and Ulster is not clear. Indeed, why they adopted this strategy was not recorded. Perhaps they hoped to prevent the very unlikely alliance between the Gaelic Irish of Ulster and Connacht by keeping both kingdoms tied down in war. Whatever his motivation, de Courcy took charge of the main force and crossed the upper reaches of the Shannon River unopposed. However, this incursion into Connacht quickly drew down all the forces Conor O'Connor could marshal. He was joined by several families from his own kingdom and also the O'Briens from Munster. De Courcy was now facing one of the biggest armies Gaelic Ireland had put into the field in years. What he did next, however, was unusual and defies logic. His route of march saw de Courcy lead his army into North Connacht, away from the security of the Norman territories. The Norman veterans among his forces would immediately have known they were in a dangerous position. North Connacht is a country pockmarked with lakes and mountains and was an ideal country for the Gaelic Irish to launch ambushes where the Normans' key weapon of heavy cavalry supported by archers was of limited use. On hearing the O'Connors were now pushing up through Connacht. After him, de Courcy took the decision not to retreat, but instead pushed on north toward the ford at Assaro, the age-old crossing point between Ulster and Connacht. Here, perhaps he hoped to cross into Ulster and connect up with the other Norman army, which was driving west through the province. While making his way up along the Shannon towards Ulster, he reached a spot evocatively known as the Falls of the Oaks, where he received crushing news. Another Gaelic army had already left Ulster and was blocking his way north. He was now trapped between two Gaelic forces. Uncertain of what lay beyond in Ulster if he fought his way into the province, he now took the decision to retrace his steps back to the Norman lands. This saw John de Courcy lead his army through the Curlew Mountains in North Roscommon. Although the term mountain is somewhat misleading, these rocky hills, which surged from the surrounding countryside to a height of 250 metres, was hard country for the Norman army. It was here now that the O'Connors swept down on them. Under severe attack, de Courcy and his forces drove east for the Shannon, eventually reaching the river, but not without severe losses. The annals of Ulster recalled the foreigners were killed with slaughter and left the country by force without a whit of triumph. As de Courcy's army straggled back across the Shannon River, it was clear the summer of 1188 was one of great defeat for the Normans. While John de Courcy had pushed into North Connacht, that other Norman army in Ulster had fared little better. They launched a huge raid, however a large force led by the O'Neill king, Don Lochlan, counterattacked, inflicting heavy losses. By the end of that year, Gerald's talk of an all-out conquest or Henry II's dreams of a Norman king ruling Ireland, were vanishing fast. However, it was even more distant by the end of the following year of 1189, which we shall see next. The fate of Ireland has often been decided by kings on far-off fields and in far-off lands. And in 1189, momentous events in France had a huge impact on the future of Ireland. 
Tensions between King Henry II and his eldest son Richard were reaching breaking point over King Henry's refusal to name him as heir. Richard, increasingly worried that Henry might name John as heir, received the backing of Philip Augustus, the King of France, who naturally wanted to see his great rival, Henry II, and his heir divided. In May 1189, war broke out between King Henry and his son Richard the Lionheart, who was supported by King Philip. Henry, now 66, was no match for Richard the Lionheart, aged 32, and Philip Augustus, who was only 23. Very quickly, the two younger men cornered King Henry II and forced him to name Richard as his heir, who in turn recognised Philip as overlord of all lands the English kings held in France, including Normandy. This was devastating for Henry, who had tried to stop this happening all of his life, but worse was yet to come for the old king. Henry II had always been dubious of Richard the Lionheart and was not surprised when he eventually went to war against him. However, after submitting to Richard and Philip, he discovered now that John, the son he had always favoured and had done so much to try and make King of Ireland, had also joined in this conspiracy against him. This was the final blow. Henry, already sick, was shattered by this treachery. On Thursday, July the 6th, 1189, one of the most powerful kings in English or French history died. He had been the first king of England to set foot on Irish soil, and claimed jurisdiction over the Ireland. However, in 1189, people were far more concerned with the world after Henry than his achievements when he had been alive. Richard the Lionheart was declared king. However, he almost immediately began to make preparations to depart on a long-awaited crusade he had promised to take a few years earlier. Before he left, he made hasty plans, trying to accommodate potential rivals who might take advantage of his absence. He bought off the King of Scotland to ensure that there would be no invasion from the north. However, John, his brother, was not so easily accommodated. He was growing tired of his title of Lord of Ireland, which had little meaning given his failures here. Richard tried to placate him with lands in England, but entrusted all power to more loyal aides. This left John resentful, and once Richard left England in 1190, he began to plot and scheme against his brother as he became increasingly power-hungry. This new setup in England, with Richard as king, had long-term consequences for Ireland. Richard the Lionheart had no interest in Ireland. While John's aims for power had far outgrown what being Lord or even King of Ireland could offer, this meant that the Norman lords in Ireland were now effectively completely off the leash and had increasing autonomy to do as they pleased. While 1189 is famous for the death of Henry II, that summer also saw another king die, which set in train a decade of violence in Ireland. Connacht in the west of Ireland was reeling from years of fighting. Warfare between claimants to the throne of the kingdom and Norman attacks had ruined the region. Through these chaotic years, Conor O'Connor had emerged victorious over his father and relatives and claimed the kingship. However, he had ruffled many feathers on his rise to power. Whether it was fear of future Norman attack given his aggressive attitude, or perhaps a personal slight he had made along the way. In 1189, an assassination plot began to take shape. That summer, Connor, who had achieved so much in a short life, was murdered by his own kinsmen. Immediately, as was par for the course, Connor's sons claimed vengeance, killing those responsible. In an effort to stabilise the wider O'Connor family, and indeed the kingdom of Connacht, the kingship was offered, yet again, to Rory O'Connor, that old king. He duly accepted, but this didn't stabilise the situation. Rory was a shadow of the man he had once been. His younger brother, Cahal of the Red Hand, quickly emerged as a rival, and a somewhat disorderly queue of contenders from within the O'Connor family began to line up, as it was obvious another civil war was on the cards. As the sun set on the first generation of Norman conquerors and their king Henry II, their horizon in Ireland was a tinge of red. The 1190s would see a lot of blood spilt as the Normans increasingly began to look at the prospect of a conquest of the divided kingdom of Connacht. Before you go, this is your last chance to book your place on the tour of medieval Ireland this coming Saturday, June 6th. This unique tour brings you into the heart of medieval Ireland. If you love the podcast, you will really enjoy this day out. 
we will see castles, abbeys, cathedrals, the stories of Norman conquest, Viking raids and witch burnings all in one unique day. You can book your ticket now at booking at irishhistorytours.ie. I hope to see you there. Until then, slán. <laughs>